The story goes, the Canadians are lucky. We have a public, single-payer healthcare system, which allows us to visit the hospital or see a family doctor without breaking the bank. Healthcare is just one of those things that our government does. One of those boring public policy things that most of us take for granted. And since healthcare is less of a hot-button political issue here than it is in certain other countries, lawmakers spend less time targeting things like abortion and gender-affirming care to rile up their base. In short, it could be a lot worse. While all this is true, if you live in Canada, you know our system is not perfect. People call Canadian healthcare universal, but that kind of seems like the wrong word, because a lot of important things aren't covered, like dental care and prescriptions, things all of us rely on at some point. And for such a rich country, Canadians wait a long time to see specialists. In 2021, the average wait time between referral and treatment was six months, with wait times in Nova Scotia averaging over a year. This March, the Canadian Canadian Medical Association released a statement titled, Canada's health system is on life support. They warned that staffing shortages, massive backlogs, and severe overworking are pushing our system to a breaking point. These problems have ramped up since COVID hit, but they've been around for years. It's not like seeing a doctor was easy before COVID. Combined, these factors make it tough for anyone to get the care they need quickly and affordably, but especially challenging for a certain group that's been in the news lately. I say that like you haven't read the title of this video. It's, it's trans youth, young trans people. We're having a hard time. This video was produced with support from Trans Pulse Canada, a 2019 community survey that asked almost 3,000 trans and non-binary people about their lives and needs, including almost 1,000 youth between the ages of 14 and 24. The data in this video is theirs, but the hot takes are all mine. As of 2019, nearly half of trans youth in Canada have an unmet health need, anything from a mobility aid they can't afford to a surgery they need but haven't had yet. Unmet health needs were over six times more common in trans youth and in the general population. And we're worse off for it. 30% of trans youth describe their health as fair or poor, and a staggering 68% describe their mental health as fair or poor. Our health isn't just worse than most young people, it's worse than most people over 55. Despite this, trans youth have less access to healthcare than cis people, and for that matter, less than trans adults. We're more likely to be on a waiting list to get healthcare, and less likely to have a primary provider like a family doctor. Most of us want to medically transition, and these obstacles can draw out the process substantially. I find that kind of worrying because medical transition is a time-sensitive thing, especially for young people whose bodies are still changing. The changes that happen from puberty into the early 20s are common sources of dysphoria, and once they've set in, they can't all be reversed. Young trans people find themselves in a window of time where medical interventions like hormones or puberty blockers can be especially helpful. Having your transition artificially delayed and missing that window can be painful or even dangerous. In this episode, of my series on trans youth and healthcare, we're talking barriers. And oh boy, are there barriers. In this country with a public health system and fairly progressive laws around trans people, why is it still so hard for many of us to get the care we need? And crucially, how can we make sure that changes? The Pulse survey asked trans youth what barriers prevent them from getting the care they need. And a lot of people, about 36%, said they couldn't afford all the care they wanted. Couldn't afford it. In this country with, and I cannot say this any more sarcastically, free healthcare. That's the problem, of course. Not all healthcare is free here. The public system is free, but it's also chronically overloaded and doesn't cover everything. For example, people usually have to pay out of pocket for things like breast augmentations or revision surgeries to fix complications they've had. Trans youth in low-income households who rely on the public plan are likely to just deal with it, either powering through the frustrations or forgoing healthcare altogether. Here in Quebec, I know people who've waited three or four years for a free family doctor. But youth who have a decent income often seek out care in the private sector, where they have to pay but don't wait as long. The disparity here is pretty stark. For trans youth in low-income households, only 62% had a primary care practitioner, like a family doctor. For youth who aren't low-income, that number jumps to 82%. And without a PCP, a lot of low-income folks get their healthcare at walk-in clinics. Walk-ins don't have the best reputations around here. I mean, it's not entirely their fault. 
A doctor you've never met before who sees a dozen new patients every day isn't going to be able to give you the same quality of care as someone you've known for years. It's not their fault, they just don't know you. Walk-ins aren't super well suited to trans healthcare, which really benefits from ongoing relationships. Things like referral letters for surgeries or follow-ups to adjust hormone dosages are easier to come by if you see one doctor for a long time. Also, not everywhere even has walk-in clinics, so if trans health relies on them too much, a lot of people are left out in the cold. That's not the only problem low-income folks run into. The survey asked people if they had ever purposely stopped taking hormones and why. Of the handful of people who had, by far the most common reason is that they couldn't afford them anymore. Prescriptions can be expensive, not least because a ton of us are uninsured. But Lily, weren't you just talking about public health insurance? You probably don't talk that way. That was mean, I'm sorry. But yeah, it sounds like I'm contradicting myself here, but I'm not. Unlike other countries with free healthcare, the Canadian system doesn't cover prescriptions for whatever reason. Instead, that coverage is left for each province to decide, most of which only offer it to a select few groups. So unless you live in a province that covers pharmacare or you have your own pharmaceutical insurance, you're out of luck. As of a 2019 report, seven and a half million Canadians don't have insurance that covers any of their prescriptions. That's about one in five of us. And without that subsidy, a lot of low-income folks can't afford their meds. With most trans youth living in low-income households, it goes without saying that a lot of us are included in those numbers. A couple years ago, my prescriptions were running me over $90 a month, and I only made $14 an hour. Sometimes I'd wait weeks to refill them and power through the withdrawal, because that's like, two weeks of groceries right there. And for what it's worth, my province does have pharmacare, it's just not great. But income inequality isn't the only obstacle here. The survey also found disparities across ethnic lines. Only about a third of racialized trans youth had gotten gender-affirming care, compared to about half of non-racialized youth. Part of this is that racialized youth were less likely to want gender-affirming care, but even those who did were less likely to have gotten it. One factor here is differences in family support. Racialized trans youth were less likely to have families who supported them. A lot of young people rely on their families for housing and financial support, and if transition would jeopardize those things, they often just hold off. The survey didn't have a huge sample of racialized trans youth, so it's hard to draw really solid conclusions from the data. I don't want to take the experience of like a hundred-ish people and project it onto tens of thousands of people, but I will say the data at least suggests that racialized trans people are less likely to have a primary care provider and that their providers are generally less informed and less open to talking about trans health issues. The Canadian medical system's racism and its transphobia compound and make it especially hard to access good care. I noticed especially striking and honestly kind of infuriating disparities when looking at Indigenous youth in particular. More than a quarter of Indigenous youth said they've been refused healthcare because of who they are, be it their trans identity ethnic background or something else. It was almost twice as common for them compared to youth who aren't Indigenous. Indigenous folks have spoken out for years about the dismissiveness, hostility, and outright violence they encounter in the medical system. And adding transness on top of that, this identity that's the subject of so much prejudice, only intensifies the problem. A lot of people are missing out on the care they need for absolutely no good reason. To say it's an oversight would be too generous. Medical racism is very much there on purpose, and it's plagued this country as long as we We've been a country. There's no viable path forward unless we tackle this. I'm not really the person to talk on how we go about doing that, but I'll link to a few people doing the work if you want to learn more. As we fight to make sure everyone can see a doctor, we run up against the dreaded waiting list. Waiting lists are a fixture of the Canadian medical system, as iconically Canadian as maple syrup, ice hockey, passive aggression. If a Canadian with public insurance needs to see a family doctor, a psychologist, or God forbid a specialist, they expect to wait a while. The biggest culprit here is understaffing. There just aren't enough doctors to go around in the public system. In my home province of Quebec, doctors are warning that working conditions have pushed them out of the public system and into private practice, where they have more agency and flexibility. Although, even with private practice, some treatments are only offered in one or two places nationwide. Until recently, any trans woman who wanted a vaginoplasty had to travel to the one clinic in Montreal. In the case of trans youth, the waitlist problem is made worse by something our own doctors do. 
needless referrals. As of 2011, most medical schools in the US and Canada offer exactly zero training on transition care, which leaves a lot of doctors unqualified to treat us. Of the trans youth respondents with the PCP, 22% said theirs didn't know enough about trans care to provide it. You'd hope they would just, I don't know, learn the stuff so they can like do their job but apparently that's too much to ask. Instead, doctors end up referring us out to specialists like endocrinologists. That's where the wait times get really wild and end up drawing out transitions by months. For most HRT patients, a referral is totally unnecessary. Prescribing hormones isn't like this uniquely complicated kind of care. Any family doctor should be able to do it. When they send their patients elsewhere, it means we end up waiting longer for the care we need and it clogs up the public system even further. Okay, so now I've listed off a bunch of problems. I assume we're all pretty bummed out by these findings, but now that we know what keeps people from healthcare, we can get to thinking about solutions. How can we break down the barriers and make sure everyone gets the care they need? Healthcare policy is incredibly complicated, and if you'll believe it, I'm not an expert. Wild, I know. There's no one decision that'll fix the public healthcare system, but there are a couple practical, realistic things we can do to help trans youth. I've got the data to back this up, but keep in mind these are ultimately my opinions and not the official positions of TransPulse Canada. First of all, solid universal pharmacare on a federal level. Subsidizing prescriptions would mean that more people who want hormones can get them, and they can afford to stay on them even if money troubles come up. Ideally, prescriptions would be free, but I don't know that any major players are gunning for that right now. Second, more training for doctors. If pediatricians and family doctors don't know how to care for us, they can learn. Thankfully, we already have a roadmap for this. Queer health groups in BC and Ontario have compiled a bunch of resources to help doctors treat their trans patients. You can check those out at the links in the description. And if you think your doctor could use more info, send it their way. That goes for cis people too. If any watch my videos, I'm not convinced. We might also want to push for the expansion of the informed consent model. The informed consent model for trans care is all about giving us the information we need to make decisions and trusting us on what's right for us. If people could reliably get gender affirming care with a doctor they already see instead of being referred elsewhere, it would mean shorter wait times and less strain on our shockingly overwhelmed healthcare system. A lot of very smart people have good ideas for improving the health system in this country. I don't have time to talk about all of them. Those are just a few we can start by learning about and advocating for. But, there's always a but, even if we make sure everyone can see a doctor, it wouldn't be a complete fix. In the third and final episode of this series, we'll look at problems trans youth encounter at the doctor. Ignorance, mistreatment, power imbalances, and the rift all this has caused between providers and the trans community. It's like probably the best episode in the series. It's very fight the power. You'll love it. Follow the link on screen or in the description if you want to check it out. This series was produced in partnership with TransPulse Canada. While I took the lead on this project, their team analyzed the data, shared resources, and offered their expert insight to bring everything together. I wrote the videos with feedback from Greta Bauer, Aidan Scheim, and Caleb Valoroso jones The data analysis was done by Jose Navarro, Joy Tran Mim, and Lux Lee. I also got to thank the expert freelancers. Sura Field Green, who shot the videos, Magenta Barabo, who translated them into French, and Vic Monjovi, who provided art direction. And of course, I wouldn't be here in the first place without the support of my loyal patrons, whose kindness has kept me going this year. It was a true team effort, and I'm so grateful to everyone involved. If you found the series interesting, head to transpulsecanada.ca and check out what else the team is up to. They put up infographics and really easy to understand reports about tons of interesting things. Barriers. Barriers, baby. Walls, borders, moats. Um, what are some other barriers? Um, like a, a wall of fire, oceans, I guess, are barriers. Yeah, oceans are barriers. Um, uh, rivers. Rivers, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, outer space. <laughs> <laughs> this will go somewhere.